Chapter 8 of A Narrative of the Life of Mrs. Mary Jemison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hilara. A Narrative of the Life of Mrs. Mary Jemison by James E. Seaver. Chapter 8. Some time near the close of the Revolutionary War, a white man by the name of Ebenezer Allen left his people in the state of Pennsylvania on the account of some disaffection towards his countrymen and came to the Genesee River to reside with the Indians. He tarried at Genishaw a few days and came up to Gardo, where I then resided. He was apparently without any business that would support him, but he soon became acquainted with my son Thomas with whom he hunted for a long time, and made his home with him at my house. Winter came on, and he continued his stay. When Allen came to my house, I had a white man living on my land, who had an anti-cook squaw for his wife, with whom he had lived very peaceably, for he was a moderate man commonly, and she was a kind, gentle, cunning creature. It so happened that he had no hay for his cattle, so that in the winter he was obliged to drive them every day, perhaps half a mile from his house, to let them feed on rushes, which in those days was so numerous as to nearly cover the ground. Allen, having frequently seen the squaw in the fall, took the opportunity when her husband was absent with his cows, daily to make her a visit, and in return for his kindnesses she made and gave him a red cap, finished and decorated in the highest Indian style. The husband had for some considerable length of time felt a degree of jealousy that Allen was trespassing upon him with the consent of his squaw. But when he saw Allen dressed in so fine an Indian cap and found that his dear Nanty Coke had presented it to him, his doubts all left him and he became so violently enraged that he caught her by the hair of her head, dragged her on the ground to my house a distance of forty rods and threw her in at the door. Hiokatu, my husband, exasperated at the sight of so much inhumanity, hastily took down his old tomahawk, which for a while had lain idle, shook it over the kakol's head, and bade him jogo, that is, go off. The enraged husband, well knowing that he should feel a blow if he waited to hear the order repeated, instantly retreated, and went down the river to his cattle. We protected the poor nanty coke woman and gave her victuals and Allen sympathized with her in her misfortunes till spring, when her husband came to her, acknowledged his former errors, and that he had abused her without a cause, promised a reformation, and she received him with every mark of a renewal of her affection. They went home lovingly, and soon after removed to Niagara. The same spring, Allen commenced working my flats, and continued to labor there till after the peace in 1783. He then went to Philadelphia on some business that detained him but a few days and returned with a horse and some dry goods, which he carried to a place that is now called Mount Morris, where he built or bought a small house. The British and Indians of the Niagara frontier, dissatisfied with the Treaty of Peace, were determined at all hazards to continue their depredations upon the white settlements, which lay between them and Albany. They actually made ready and were about setting out on an expedition to that effect when Allen, who by this time understood their customs of war, took a belt of wampum, which he had fraudulently procured, and carried it as a token of peace from the Indians to the commander of the nearest American military post. The Indians were soon answered by the American officer that the wampum was cordially accepted and that a continuance of peace was ardently wished for. The Indians, at this, were chagrined and disappointed beyond measure, but as they held the wampum to be a sacred thing, they dared not go against the import of its meaning and immediately buried the hatchet as it respected the people of the United States, and smoked the pipe of peace. They, however, resolved to punish Allen for his officiousness in meddling with their national affairs by presenting the sacred wampum without their knowledge and went about devising means for his detection. A party was accordingly dispatched from Fort Niagara to apprehend him, 
with orders to conduct him to that post for trial or for safe keeping till such time as his fate should be determined upon in a legal manner. The party came on, but before it arrived at Gardo, Allen got news of its approach and fled for safety, leaving the horse and goods that he had brought from Philadelphia an easy prey to his enemies. He had not been long absent when they arrived at Gardo, where they made diligent search for him till they were satisfied that they could not find him, and then seized the effects which he had left and returned to Niagara. My son Thomas went with them with Allen's horse and carried the goods. Allen, on finding that his enemies had gone, came back to my house where he lived as before, but of his return they were soon notified at Niagara, and Nettles, who married Priscilla Ramsay, with a small party of Indians, came on to take him. He, however, by some means found that they were near, and gave me his box of money and trinkets to keep safely till he called for it, and again took to the woods. Nettles came on determined at all events to take him before he went back, and in order to accomplish his design, he, with his Indians, hunted in the daytime and lay by at night at my house, and in that way they practiced for a number of days. Allen watched the motion of his pursuers, and every night after they had gone to rest, came home and got some food and then returned to his retreat. It was in the fall, and the weather was cold and rainy, so that he suffered extremely. Some nights he sat in my chamber till nearly daybreak, while his enemies were below, and when the time arrived, I assisted him to escape unnoticed. Nettles, at length, abandoned the chase, went home, and Allen, all in tatters, came in. By running in the woods, his clothing had become torn into rags, so that he was in a suffering condition, almost naked. Hiokatu gave him a blanket and a piece of broadcloth for a pair of trousers. Allen made his trousers himself, and then built a raft on which he went down the river to his own place at Mont Morris. About that time he married a squaw whose name was Sally. The Niagara people, finding that he was at his own house, came and took him by surprise when he least expected them, and carried him to Niagara. Fortunately for him, it so happened that just as they arrived at the fort, a house took fire and his keepers all left him to save the building, if possible. Allen had supposed his doom to be nearly sealed, but finding himself at liberty, he took to his heels, left his escort to put out the fire, and ran to Tonawanta. There, an Indian gave him some refreshment and a good gun, with which he hastened on to Little Beard's town, where he found his squaw. Not daring to risk himself at that place for fear of being given up, he made her but a short visit and came immediately to Gardo. Just as he got to the top of the hill above the Gardo flats, he discovered a party of British soldiers and Indians in pursuit of him. And in fact, they were so near that he was satisfied that they saw him and concluded that it would be impossible for him to escape. The love of liberty, however, added to his natural swiftness, gave him sufficient strength to make his escape to his former castle of safety. His pursuers came immediately to my house, where they expected to have found him secreted and under my protection. They told me where they had seen him but a few moments before, and that they were confident that it was within my power to put him into their hands. As I was perfectly clear of having had any hand in his escape, I told them plainly that I had not seen him since he was taken to Niagara, and that I could give them no information at all respecting him. Still unsatisfied and doubting my veracity, they advised my Indian brother to use his influence to draw from me the secret of his concealment, which they had an idea that I considered of great importance, not only to him, but to myself. I persisted in my ignorance of his situation, and finally they left me. Although I had not seen Allen, I knew his place of security, and was well aware that if I told them the place where he had formerly hid himself, they would have no difficulty in making him a prisoner. He came to my house in the night, and awoke me with the greatest caution, fearing that some of his enemies might be watching to take him at a time when and in a place where it would be impossible for him to make his escape. I got up and assured him that he was then safe, but that his enemies would return early in the morning and search him out if it should be possible. 
having given him some victuals, which he received thankfully, I told him to go, but to return the next night, to a certain corner of the fence near my house, where he would find a quantity of meal that I would have well prepared, and deposit it there for his use. Early the next morning, Nettles and his company came in while I was pounding the meal for Allen, and insisted upon my giving him up. I again told them that I did not know where he was, and that I could not, neither would I, tell them anything about him. I well knew that Allen considered his life in my hands, and although it was my intention not to lie, I was fully determined to keep his situation a profound secret. They continued their labour, and examined, as they supposed, every crevice, gully, tree, and hollow log in the neighbouring woods, and at last concluded that he had left the country, and gave him up for lost, and went home. At that time, Allen lay in a secret place in the gulf, a short distance above my flats, in a hole that he accidentally found in the rock near the river. At night he came and got the meal at the corner of the fence, as I had directed him, and afterwards lived in the gulf two weeks. Each night he came to the pasture and milked one of my cows, without any other vessel in which to receive the milk than his hat, out of which he drank it. I supplied him with meal, but fearing to build a fire he was obliged to eat it raw and wash it down with the milk. Nettles, having left our neighbourhood, and Allen, considering himself safe, left his little cave and came home. I gave him his box of money and trinkets, and he went to his own house at Mount Morris. It was generally considered by the Indians of our tribe that Allen was an innocent man, and that the Niagara people were persecuting him without a just cause. Little Beard, then about to go to the eastward on public business, charged his Indians not to meddle with Allen, but to let him live amongst them peaceably, and enjoy himself with his family and property if he could. Having the protection of the chief, he felt himself safe, and let his situation be known to the whites, from whom he suspected no harm. They, however, were more inimicable than our Indians, and were easily bribed by Nettles to assist in bringing him to justice. Nettles came on, and the whites, as they had agreed, gave poor Allen up to him. He was bound and carried to Niagara, where he was confined in prison through the winter. In the spring, he was taken to Montreal or Quebec for trial, and was honourably acquitted. The crime for which he was tried was for his having carried the wampum to the Americans, and thereby putting too sudden a stop to their war. From the place of his trial, he went directly to Philadelphia, and purchased on credit a boat load of goods which he brought by water to Conhocton, where he left them and came to Mount Morris for assistance to get them brought on. The Indians readily went with horses and brought them to his house, where he disposed of his dry goods, but not daring to let the Indians begin to drink strong liquor, for fear of the quarrels which would naturally follow, he sent his spirits to my place, and we sold them. For his goods he received ginseng roots, principally, and a few skins. Ginseng, at that time, was plenty, and commanded a high price. We prepared the whole that he received for the market, expecting that he would carry them to Philadelphia. In that I was disappointed, for when he had disposed of and got pay for all his goods, he took the ginseng and skins to Niagara, and there sold them and came home. Tired of dealing in goods, he planted a large field of corn on or near his own land, attended to it faithfully, and succeeded in raising a large crop which he harvested, loaded into canoes, and carried down the river to the mouth of Allen's Creek, then called by the Indians, Ginnisaga, where he unloaded it, built him a house, and lived with his family. The next season he planted corn at that place, and built a grist and sawmill on Genesee Falls, now called Rochester. At the time Allen built the mills, he had an old German living with him by the name of Andrews, whom he sent in a canoe down the river with his mill irons. Allen went down at the same time, but before they got to the mills, Allen threw the old man overboard and drowned him, as it was then generally believed, for he was never seen or heard of afterwards. 
In the course of the season in which Allen built his mills, he became acquainted with the daughter of a white man who was moving to Niagara. She was handsome, and Allen soon got into her good graces, so that he might be married and took her home to be a joint partner with Sally, the squaw, whom she had never heard of till she got home and found her in full possession. But it was too late for her to retrace the hasty steps she had taken, for her father had left her in the care of her tender husband and gone on. She, however, found that she enjoyed at least an equal half of her husband's affections and made herself contented. Her father's name I have forgotten, but hers was Lucy. Allen was not contented with two wives, for in a short time after he had married Lucy, he came up to my house, where he found a young woman who had an old husband with her. They had been on a long journey, and called at my place to recruit and dress themselves. She filled Allen's eye, and he accordingly fixed upon a plan to get her into his possession. He praised his situation, enumerated his advantages, and finally persuaded them to go home and tarry with him a few days at least and partake of a part of his comforts. They accepted his generous invitation and went home with him. But they had been there but two or three days when Allen took the old gentleman out to view his flats and, as they were deliberately walking on the bank of the river, pushed him into the water. The old man, almost strangled, succeeded in getting out. But his fall and exertions had so powerful an effect upon his system that he died in two or three days and left his young widow to the protection of his murderer. She lived with him about one year in a state of concubinage and then left him. How long Allen lived at Allen's Creek I am unable to state. But soon after the young widow left him, he removed to his old place at Mount Morris and built a house where he made Sally his squaw by whom he had two daughters, a slave to Lucy, by whom he had had one son. Still, however, he considered Sally to be his wife. After Allen came to Mount Morris at that time, he married a girl by the name of Morilla Gregory, whose father, at the time, lived on Genesee Flats. The ceremony being over, he took her home to live in common with his other wives. But his house was too small for his family, for Sally and Lucy, conceiving that their lawful privileges would be abridged if they received a partner, united their strength and whipped poor Marilla so cruelly that he was obliged to keep her in a small Indian house a short distance from his own or lose her entirely. Marilla, before she left Mount Morris, had four children. One of Marilla's sisters lived with Allen about a year after Marilla was married and then quit him. A short time after they all got to living at Mount Morris, Allen prevailed upon the chiefs to give to his Indian children a tract of land four miles square, where he then resided. The chiefs gave them the land, but he so artfully contrived the conveyance that he could apply it to his own use and by alienating his right, destroy the claim of his children. Having secured the land in that way to himself, he sent his two Indian girls to Trenton, New Jersey, and his white son, to Philadelphia for the purpose of giving each of them a respectable English education. While his children were at school, he went to Philadelphia and sold his right to the land which he had begged of the Indians for his children to Robert Morris. After that, he sent for his daughters to come home, which they did. Having disposed of the whole of his property on the Genesee River, he took his two white wives and their children, together with his effects, and removed to a Delaware town on the river de Trench in Upper Canada. When he left Mount Morris, Sally, his squaw, insisted upon going with him and actually followed him, crying bitterly and praying for his protection some two or three miles till he absolutely bade her leave him or he would punish her with severity. At length, finding her case hopeless, she returned to the Indians. At the great treaty at Big Tree, one of Allen's daughters claimed the land which he had sold to Morris. The claim was examined and decided against her in favor of Ogden, Trumbull, Rogers and others who were the creditors of Robert Morris. Allen yet believed that his daughter had an indisputable right to the land in question and got me to go with Mother Farley 
a half indian woman to assist him by interceding with morris for it and to urge the propriety of her claim we went to thomas morris and having stated to him our business he told us plainly that he had no land to give away and that as the title was good he never would allow allen nor his heirs one foot or words to that effect we returned to allen the answer we had received and he conceiving all further attempts to be useless went home he died at the delaware town on the river de trench in the year 1814 or 15 and left two white widows and one squaw with a number of children to lament his loss by his last will he gave all his property to his last wife morella and her children without providing in the least for the support of lucy or any of the other members of his family lucy soon after his death went with her children down the ohio river to receive assistance from her friends in the revolutionary war allen was a tory and by that means became acquainted with our indians when they were in the neighborhood of his native place desolating the settlements on the susquehanna in those predatory battles he joined them and as i have often heard the indians say for cruelty was not exceeded by any of his indian comrades at one time when he was scouting with the indians in the susquehanna country he entered a house very early in the morning where he found a man his wife and one child in bed the man as he entered the door instantly sprang on the floor for the purpose of defending himself and little family but allen dispatched him at one blow he then cut off his head and threw it bleeding into the bed with the terrified woman took the little infant from its mother's breast and holding it by its legs dashed its head against the jam and left the unhappy widow and mother to mourn alone over her murdered family it has been said by some that after he had killed the child he opened the fire and buried it under the coals and embers but of that i am not certain i have often heard him speak of that transaction with a great degree of sorrow and as the foulest crime he had ever committed one for which i have no doubt he repented end of chapter 8 recording by hilara